Financial freedom is often misunderstood as meaning that you have lots of money. In reality, financial freedom means the ability to own your assets and decide how, where, and when they are spent. Another misconception is that money you have in the bank belongs to you. In reality, the banks own your money, and your money will even be used to bail them out during the next economic crisis. Today, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about bank bail-ins, including where they came from, who is behind them, and how you can protect your assets before it's too late. Before I start, a reminder that none of what follows is financial advice. OK, let's go back in time to the 2008 financial crisis. As some of you will know, this monetary Ragnarok was caused by the bursting of the housing bubble. More accurately, big banks invested in bundles of bad mortgages, which crashed in value when the housing bubble burst. Initially, the big banks thought everything was fine. That was until the collapse of Lehman Brothers in the autumn of 2008. Lehman was a well-known and well-respected investment bank. As such, the news of its bankruptcy sent Wall Street into a frenzy, which eventually threatened the entire financial system. In the end, the US government had to step in to basically bail out Wall Street. According to CNN, the US Treasury gave over $200 billion in loans to hundreds of financial institutions. Now, this is less than a third of the total cost of bailing out the entire financial system, which is estimated to be $700 billion. Meanwhile, the regular people who were affected by the financial collapse got essentially nothing. Everyone knew that Wall Street speculation was to blame, but only one person went to jail. Karim Sarageldin, a former executive at Credit Suisse. All the other big bank executives were given bonuses. Now, if you watched our video about the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, you'll know that the regulator was supposed to investigate just how much the big banks were to blame for 2008. Well, instead of investigating, the SEC allegedly destroyed the evidence it had been given as part of the investigation. Not surprisingly, the average person was not happy about how 2008 was handled. And many of you will know that the bank bailouts are why Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin. The politicians had a different solution for the unwashed masses, however, and that was to pass a long list of new regulations. One of these was the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States, which was passed in the summer of 2010. Now, the Dodd-Frank Act is infamous for being long, vaguely worded, and containing some questionable provisions. The primary focus of the act was the enormous derivatives market. For those unfamiliar, a derivative is an investment that derives its value from some underlying asset. An easy example is futures. When you buy a futures contract, you're effectively betting that the price of some asset will be higher or lower at some future date, without having to actually buy the asset itself. Now, the total value of the derivative market is estimated to be as high as one quadrillion dollars, or one thousand trillion dollars. The actual value is unknown because of poor accounting, but what is known is that the 25 largest banks hold roughly 250 trillion dollars of derivatives. Obviously, that is a huge financial risk. That's why the Dodd-Frank Act included a provision which states that in the event of a financial collapse, derivatives claims come first. In other words, if 2008 happens again, derivatives debt owed by big banks will be paid off before anything else. The difference is that these debts won't be paid off by bailouts, but by bail-ins. Now, whereas a bailout is when a big bank receives money from someone else to pay back its debts, a bail-in is when a big bank uses its clients' money to pay back its debts. This includes people who lent money to the bank and people who have money in accounts with the bank, such as, well, you and me. The Dodd-Frank Act opened the door to allowing big banks to use their client funds to bail in themselves the next time there is a financial crisis. It's assumed that the next financial crisis 
will be caused by an issue in the derivatives market, and derivatives debt will again take precedence in the payouts. If you're wondering who came up with this insane idea, the answer is Paul Colello and Wilson Irvin, both of whom used to be key executives at Credit Suisse. The pair coined the term bail-in in an article for The Economist in January 2010. Paul died just a few months later, reportedly from cancer. In a presentation about bail-ins, Wilson revealed that the people in power had been working on alternatives to bailouts since 2008. He explained that the desire to develop an alternative to bailouts increased after the financial crisis started to affect Europe. In mid-2012, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, published a paper advocating for bail-ins as the ideal alternative to bailouts. The IMF paper had almost the same title as the Economist article by Paul and Wilson from two years earlier. All the IMF needed was somewhere to test this new bail-in method. Enter Cyprus. Now, Cyprus was one of the European countries that was hit the hardest when the 2008 contagion spread to the continent. By the end of 2012, Cyprus was on the brink of default and begging for a bailout. In early 2013, the IMF and the European Union bailed Cyprus out for 10 billion euros. As with all IMF loans, the bailout came with multiple conditions. One of the conditions was for Cyprus's largest bank to execute the first ever bail-in. Almost 50% of all bank account balances worth more than €100,000 were seized. A substantial proportion of these funds reportedly belonged to Russian oligarchs. Cyprus was also required to take 6.9% of all bank balances lower than 100000 and 9.9% of all bank balances higher than 100000 regardless of the bank. Despite the social chaos and capital controls that ensued, the first ever bank bail-in was declared a success by the IMF and its allies. In 2014, the G20 countries agreed to pass bail-in laws in accordance with the Financial Stability Board, or FSB's, bail-in guidelines. The FSB's guidelines include the issuance of bail-in bonds, which should be sold to pension funds. Newsflash, this means your pension money could be used to bail out banks too. The United States was the first to legalise bail-ins in 2010 with the aforementioned Dodd-Frank Act. The UK followed suit in 2013 with the Financial Services Act. The EU legalised bail-ins in 2016 with the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive. So, be sure to check when your country legalised bail-ins. And if you think this is crazy, you should check out our video about digital ID. That will be down in the description. Anyways, I must stress that the specifics of bank bail-in laws tend to vary from country to country. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to get into the details about each one here. However, all these bail-in laws seem to follow the same three rules, likely because of their collective conformity with the FSB. The first rule is that bank bail-ins are only allowed for banks that are deemed to be domestically or globally important. It's not entirely clear which banks fall into the domestically important category, but it's safe to assume that this rule pertains to those with the most assets under management. As for globally important banks, the FSB publishes a list of them every year, along with their de facto risk of default due to derivatives debt. There are currently 30 globally systemically important banks, with JP Morgan being noted as the highest risk. JP Morgan reportedly has 60 to 70 trillion dollars of derivatives debt. If you're wondering what happens when a non-systemically important bank goes under, the answer seems to be that they get to be acquired by a domestically or globally important bank. If that wasn't wild enough, regulators are trying to apply these laws to crypto exchanges. More on that in a moment. Now, the second rule of bank bail-ins is that they do not apply to bank balances below the deposit insurance threshold. In the US, the FDIC covers $250,000 of deposits. In the UK, the FSCS covers £85,000, and in the EU, it's €100,000, with various insurers involved. If you think this means your money is safe, think again. As pointed out by the Huffington Post, quote, 
Deposit insurance funds in both the US and Europe are woefully underfunded, particularly when derivative claims are factored in. In short, insurers don't have enough money to cover all bank deposits. In the case of the FDIC, its 2021 annual report suggests that it only has around $120 billion in its insurance fund. This is a drop in the bucket compared to the $19 trillion of bank deposits in the US and a speck of sand in the desert of the derivatives market, which could be in the quadrillions. Luckily, there's the third rule of bank bail-ins, which states that you will be given some alternative asset in exchange for your lost deposits. Now, believe it or not, but these alternative assets are typically shares in the bank that you bailed out. Let that sink in. The bank takes your money and gives you its worthless stock in return. Not only that, but if governments manage to pass laws to make central bank digital currencies or CBDCs legal tender, you could very well be paid back in CBDC instead of cash. Come to think of it, bank bail-ins would be the perfect way to force people to adopt CBDCs, and perhaps that's the whole point. Speculation aside, it's important to note that you could temporarily lose access to your funds during a bank bail-in. As we've seen with Cyprus, banks could put limits on their hours of operations, limits on payments, limits on transfers, and limits on cash withdrawals until the bail-in process is complete. More evidence comes from a bank bail-in document from the Bank of Scotland, which suggests that it could take up to a week for you to get your insured deposits back. I imagine there would be a similar lag for other banks around the world. Make no mistake, the social unrest that would trigger would be truly unprecedented. Now, the people in power appear to be hyper aware of this because they've apparently been running bank bail in simulations for years. The most recent high profile bank simulation was held by the FDIC in November last year. Although the FDIC simulation is publicly available, it's predictably hard to find. The simulation featured dozens of panelists from prominent financial institutions and regulators that you've probably never heard of. As you might have guessed, one of them was Wilson Irvin, who seems to keep a very low profile these days, despite or maybe because of being the chief architect of the bank bail-in process. Now, I'll leave a link to the full simulation in the description if you're interested, but I'll reiterate that it's hard to find even with the link. I'll also caution that it's lengthy and contains lots of financial jargon. In any case, the most exciting stuff begins around the one hour mark. Snippets from this section went viral. At roughly one hour and 18 minutes, one of the panelists ponders how the FDIC and its secret allies should maintain the public's confidence in the financial system when the bail-ins inevitably happen. She argues that transparency is the answer, but that some entities should get more transparency than others. This particular panelist also made an off-the-cuff comment about making sure the public understands that, quote, prior compensation could be clawed back. Now, maybe I'm hearing things, but that sounds like it's possible for the banks to take your money long after the bail-in process has been completed. She even asked the other panelists how they can, quote, address excess cash use in such a crisis. This suggests that governments could very well be planning on introducing a CBDC using bank bail-ins. Then again, it could just be a reference to the freeze on cash withdrawals I was talking about earlier. As a cherry on top, the panelist also said that they should, quote, make the announcement on a Friday, ideally a Friday night. For context, Fridays are famous for being one of the days when nobody pays attention to the news, hence why bad news often comes out on Fridays, the more you know. A second panelist agreed with the first about being selective with transparency about the bail-in and specified that they should tell the banks and big investors first. He said they shouldn't tell the public until later because they would panic. A third panelist agreed with the second and said something sinister, along the lines of, the public has more faith in the banking system than we do. Let's keep it that way. The other panelists laughed. He went on to repeat that only institutional investors should know what's going on and they should, quote, be careful with what we tell the public. 
But wait, there's more. A fourth panellist then said something even more sinister. I had to listen to it three times because I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. The timestamp is around one hour and 27 minutes. She literally says, quote, The information should go out once we're moving out of the recession. Make of that what you will. This fourth panellist went on to explain that non-bank entities, including cryptocurrency exchanges, should be included in the bail-in process. Now, this could mean that she wants them to be subject to acquisition by big banks or that she wants to use the crypto you hold on exchanges to bail them in. A little later, Wilson said that they must make sure that disinformation about bank bail-ins doesn't get out before the fact-check approved version of events. He even went as far as suggesting that this online censorship should happen in advance so that people don't talk about their money being taken. It just so happens that governments around the world are in the process of rolling out exactly these kinds of online censorship laws, and most of them will be going into force later this year or next year. You can find out all about that using the link in the description. I strongly suggest watching that video. So, this brings me to the big question, and that's what you can do to protect your money from being taken by the big banks when the next financial crisis comes around. There are lots of things you can do, and they all fall under one umbrella. Keep your money out of globally and domestically important banks. Before you do anything, though, I'll remind you to check the details of the bank bail-in laws in your country or region. This is admittedly easier said than done, but you should be able to get the answers to all the questions you have, well, at the bank. Pro tip, ask about shared accounts and multiple accounts. That said, the first hedge against bank bail-ins is to move your money to smaller banks that are not globally or domestically important. Ideally, these small banks will have little to no exposure to globally or domestically important ones, but I suspect it's going to be hard to find a small bank with zero exposure. The second hedge against bank bail-ins is to always keep enough cash on hand to pay for at least a few months of expenses. Depending on your personal circumstances, though, this may not be ideal or even possible. Also, keep in mind that fiat currencies are losing value by the day due to inflation and will continue to do so. This ties into the third hedge against bank bail-ins, and that's to have some physical gold and silver, ideally in denominations that could be used for payment if needs be. As a fun fact, gold and silver eagles are technically legal tender in the US. The catch is their face value is much lower than their actual value. The fourth hedge against bank bail-ins, meanwhile, which is the best in my personal opinion, is to hold cryptocurrency. Now, to be clear, this means decentralized cryptocurrencies like BTC, ETH, and XMR, not centralized ones like stablecoins. Ideally, these cryptos will be kept in your own personal crypto wallet. And if you don't have a crypto wallet, you can get a discount on one using the link in the description. I digress. Now, any of these four hedges will work, and ideally you should do all of them, not financial advice, of course. If the slips of the tongue at the FDIC simulation are anything to go by, the people in power will start doing bank bail-ins after the next recession. Now, I honestly have no idea when that could be. It doesn't seem to matter either because they don't plan on telling us that our money has been used to bail in the banks until all the institutional investors have gotten out. At least we know the announcement will be made on a Friday when nobody's paying attention, as per the FDIC panelist. The real wild card is what happens after the bank bail-ins are announced. Again, the social unrest will be unprecedented. Now, this could conveniently create another crisis that the people in power could use as an excuse to exercise even more control. Never mind the possibility of CBDC-based insurance payouts. The silver lining to this situation is that people are becoming increasingly aware of what's going on and what the elites are planning. If you want to help with that, take a second to share this video with someone you think would enjoy it and like and subscribe so that you don't miss the next one. And on that note, I will see you next time.